Caleb Williams takes his top 30 visit in Chicago, and with only just about three weeks left until the Bears potentially take this quarterback, Nick and I feel like it's about time we finally do a proper breakdown of Chicago's likely new signal caller, plus a little bit of conversation about the Bears' current top 30 visits and what to do at number nine, all on this episode of Bear With Us. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to Bear With Us, a Chicago Bears podcast hosted by yours truly, Robert Schmitz, right here with my co-host, Nick Whalen, myself of the Bears blog, he of Football Guys, as we try to build the best possible Bears podcast. And Nick, it's been a hot minute, not too long, right? But yeah. it, this is about the longest break we've had. What you been up to? Yeah, man. I mean, it's uh, it's wedding season. Uh, I'm getting married in in May and... Uh... Uh, I mean, besides that, it's, it's busy like school year as well. So this is, uh, this is crunch time, but it's, it's crunch time for the draft. Honestly, I feel a little bit now, Robert, it's like, I wish the draft was like tomorrow. Like I, I've already done my prep and it feels like we're just exhausting the options now. And considering we know who's going to go one-on-one. Let, let's just have the thing already, right? That's the other piece to this. I feel like, Nick, w- people like us, content creators, right? We get put in a really, uh, look, I think it's a tough position. Anybody who's listening, I expect you to laugh when when you hear that because it's not that hard a position. But, Nick, you're either disturbingly early to most modern topics or you're hilariously late. And call me nuts. I've been trying to save most of my Caleb breakdowns for when he's actually chosen. <gasps> yeah. What? Like right. the point, it felt weird to me to talk beyond a generality about Caleb Williams while Justin Fields was still the quarterback. It feels mm-hmm. weird to me if I was going to do that then to suddenly do it now. But I mean, you brought up a great point pre-show that at this point, I mean, Caleb Williams, according to Ian Rappaport, only taking one top 30 visit. Bears being about as obvious as they could possibly be. Keenan Allen casually showing up to the USC Pro Day. Mm -hmm. Colin Cowherd suddenly thinking the Bears are actually a great spot to land. Look, some of these, especially the Colin point, pretty lukewarm, if not outright weak. But you get it, don't you? Like, it feels as if the only thing that potentially would say that the bears aren't about to pick Caleb is some massive bears fans worst fear. And that's about it because all the other signs seem to be pointing towards Caleb in Chicago. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, the other part too is, and we'll get into this later is uh, the top 30 visits. I mean, there's no other quarterback. Caleb's visiting no other place, which we talked about the medicals, which means Chicago is the only team that'll have the medicals. Like it seems like a really, really far gone conclusion now that they would go any other option but Caleb and in trading away fields means they're not going to move down like all that stuff's gone and so now it's just you know because they they brought also to the uh the team dinner or I'm sorry the dinner they brought teammates like actual veterans from the team which like that's a little bit of a different move but it's like hey they want to introduce and they want like to me it's like it's more of a a formality than anything else at this point. I assume it has to be twofold, right, Nick? I mean, let me hit you with another side of what you're talking about, where on the whiteboard, Caleb has distinguished himself. And if you ask me, look, not Nick, that I would assume that all football coaches are exactly the same, but if Ryan Poles, Shane Waldron, Matt Eberflus, if they respect Lincoln Riley, then asking Lincoln Riley, okay, man, but but be for real, is he good on the whiteboard? You Mm -hmm. should know how to hear that answer. Like, Nick, if you were talking about one of your guys that wasn't very good on the whiteboard, you're not going to say he's bad, but you're going to leave hints, right? Mm -hmm. About like, you know, he knows it better than he can articulate it. And we're still working on that ability to articulate it and other ways to get around saying what you're getting around. The point I Mm -hmm. guess I'm making is by the time the Bears met with Caleb Williams at the scouting combine, you have to think that they knew pretty much all there was to know about him. The Bears could be at the point where the only real question they have is how is he going to lead the team? Like the the Bears team, the one we have. Just to that point, though, Robert, like it seems weird. Like we have this due diligence last year. You know, Mm -hmm. we're going to look at all the quarterbacks and then see, and then we stay with fields. This year we're going to look at our options, but they're bringing no one else in. Like 
I I'm almost bothered that they didn't bring in Drake May, who's my quarterback too, or uh, Jane Daniels or JJ McCarthy. Like they didn't even bring them in for top 30 visit to even like question it. Like what, what if like, what if the medicals were terrible for some reason and we need to think of another option? They're, they're not even doing it. Like that seems like it's so concrete that it's him. It does. You're not even looking at other options. I mean, it's bizarre. And it's funny, right? Because I think through the lens of perfect process, I'm with you that I want these guys to have done their homework. But I also think we're living in an ever evolving information age. I mean, how much do you need these interviews? I don't know the answer. I'm not yeah. trying to imply an answer, right? Mm -hmm. It's more like it seems as if in 1995, there was a million things you didn't know about these guys. Oh, Heck, yeah. the cameras didn't have the quality to tell you about these guys for the most part. But the other part that, Nick, I can't imagine helps anything is that the Chicago Bears, when they were 0-4, probably thought they had a realistic chance of locking up the number one overall pick themselves. If there was right. any organization to have already gotten a massive head start, it wasn't Washington, who, if memory serves, started at least 2-2. Two and two. I mean, I can't exactly remember so that may be totally wrong right but the bears start oh and four dude like you have to well, think they had, the, they had the first and second pick for a while didn't they yes they did it was yeah. looking like we were trending in that direction so you think that the bears didn't send pretty much everybody to like to the coliseum the usc stadium mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. often as possible you think they weren't there in force for the notre dame game they've right. been getting a sneak peek at Caleb for a very long time. And I'm right there with you that at least in theory, when you write it on a whiteboard, we're going to talk to Caleb and we're going to pretty much ignore everybody else. Real weird. But mm -hmm. I mean, he's also my QB one. So yeah. I guess yeah. I'm only not bothered because they're landing on what I think is the only result. I mean, what do mm -hmm. you think? Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. I, honestly, I think like, let's, let's talk a little of his game, I think, just so people can, uh, um, you know, get, get a feel for Caleb Williams. Cause you can turn on highlights, you know, but I think me and you have both watched, I mean, five to 10 of his games, <laughs> you know, like the all 22 stuff. And, um, so I, I guess I'll start, I'll, I'll go, um, I'll go with a couple of points and then we'll kind of go back and forth. Sure. Honestly, there's so much I think we could talk about. I think there is. Um, the one thing is within, I felt like people talk about him playing off script all the time. And the one thing that I think it gets kind of misconstrued with him is USC's offense really hamstrung him. It was like, mm -hmm. this is going to be this big shot play. And then if it's not open, Caleb's got to be Superman and, and make something out of nothing. And, and that wasn't, that was the case. Sometimes it wasn't him always trying to just be a Superman for no reason. I mean, there were several teams that played press man. So then the guys didn't get open. Their USC receivers aren't as good this year, the year before they had, they had Jordan Addison. So I think that point that people kind of always hit on is like, well, he doesn't play in structure at all. He does if the guys are open or it makes sense. Cause there were times it's like third and five and the guy turns around at three yards. He's like, I'm not going to throw this, you know? So there were, I'm not going to say he's perfect. There were turndowns that he had, but I think a lot of time the off script uh, that people always throw at him as a negative, I think the offense really hindered some of that. What were your thoughts on that? I mean, I definitely think that's true, but man, Nick, let's go full coach. Let's break this thing all the way down. I think we can reach a place that a lot of people haven't already. Nick, let me ask you an obvious question. Why do the fundamentals exist? Like when coaches preach the fundamentals, what is the purpose of the fundamentals? Yeah, it's it's so that you can perform at a high level consistently. Really? It's to perform at a high level consistently. It's because, to put it another way, the fundamentals are there to make you better, right? Mm -hmm. And is that, why is that? Is it because the fundamentals make you better or is it because going away from the fundamentals makes you worse? Which oh, of those yeah. statements do you think yeah. is more true? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give a quick analogy, okay? Have you, you ever played pool before or billiards? Yes. Yeah. The, the further your stroke is, the further you come away and go forward to hit the cue ball, mm -hmm. the more room for error there is. That's why yes. like the long, the long release isn't as good as the short release because you can get more consistent with it. So that's kind of the I same agree. thing. Things like get through your drop back very quickly. Things like don't throw across your body. Definitely not when you're on the run. Things mm -hmm. like 
make sure you throw on time. And if you're not throwing on time, don't throw it at all. Things like make sure you find that flat defender if you're throwing a curl route over there, because if you didn't find him, he's going to yep. pick you off. These basic quarterbacking things. I mean, I could make a million metaphors, but Nick, they're there to keep you from trouble, right? Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. So what does a player's game look like when he his natural talent has completely insulated him from the problems that those lack of fundamentals should create. What right. what what happens when him throwing late give he can still throw it at fifty six <laughs> some odd miles an hour and fit the ball in anyways? What happens when throwing across his body creates way more touchdowns than it does interceptions? Mm -hmm. What happens when throwing the ball with your so? Normally, you'd have your left foot forward, your right foot backwards as you throw, especially a seam or a pop yep. pass to a tight end. Yep. What happens when Caleb learns that he can pull his left foot back as far as he wants to? He can throw yep. that with his hips pointed the, the complete wrong direction. And it's going to take until a bad night in Notre Dame before he ever throws a pick. Normally, that pass floats yep. right into his, his tight end's hands. What happens? I mean, yep. you learn a different game than everybody else did because those mm -hmm. fundamentals are there to make your game survive. Like we could talk about thriving. That's what the talent's supposed to do. These are supposed to clean up all the mistake areas. Caleb mm -hmm. doesn't make the same mistakes, breaking no. the rules that a lot of other people do until he gets a little too big for his britches. He throws, well, he massively underthrows a ball against Car Colorado, right? But yeah, your turn. Yeah. What, what do you well, think? Well, like, like to kind of put it into context for people, like the, like the bad end of this is of getting away from fundamentals and being able to be get away with things because you have your whole life. That's kind of like Jay Cutler in Chicago, right? Like sometimes like, oh my gosh, made this awesome play here. But then you'll have the three interception, the four interception games a lot of time against Green Bay, unfortunately. Rip. Like that was like the bad end of it. But then the good end of getting away with stuff is kind of like what Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes, et cetera, can do. Oh, yeah. Because he has, and part of it too, why he can get away with the fundamentals stuff is, I mean, one, there's processing, but two, he's got this, um, this, this core strength, flexibility, being able to throw off platform, um, within his physical structure that not everybody has, like, he's a, he's a thick, strong dude, you know? And like, yes. and that, that's part of what, like, like Gene Daniels is is very linear like skinny and tall a great and way to he put can't it. do that so like the body body structure wise too he can get away with it because of that yep and nick i mean the other piece that i look at it is so why does nick Foles play why did sorry nick you're not in the league anymore why <laughs> did nick Foles play the pure version of football that he did because that's the thing at the especially at the end of nick's career when he got to chicago nick did things one way he was going to work the ball pre-snap as much as possible. I mean, he's going to work at the death, right? And well, then he, he was to. Gonna, then he was going to throw. Exactly. I'm going to let you skip to the end there. <laughs> he had to, right? I think the intriguing part to Caleb Williams' game is you take a look at 2022. What do you see? You see a grab bag of playing on schedule when he feels like it, playing off schedule when he feels like it, and generally being ridiculously successful. I mean, more often than not, including 2023, when Caleb played off schedule, he was justified in doing so. Like, if the ends justify the means, Caleb was fine, especially yeah. creatively. The intriguing piece to me in this, Nick, is there's no player out there. We can look at Justin Fields if you need a very clear metaphor of this, who will ever work on something until somebody makes you. Nobody could stop Shaq in the post. He stopped attempting to practice any other shot. Because nobody could stop Shaq in the post. Yeah. The Notre Dame game finally squeezes Caleb's looseness with the football. What happens? He throws two interceptions the rest of the season. I actually think he throws one. And that ball, if you ask me, because it was against UCLA, comes off of a route where Brennan Rice gets pushed into the sidelines. And that should never happen on a go route that most coaches would tell you, yeah, sure, you got to wear that it's the interception quarterback but receiver bro what are we doing yeah. we can't yeah. get muscled like that his pocket presence got immeasurably better his sack rate got a major step forward he played within structure down the back stretch i thought more than he did in the early part of the season was he nick was he growing yeah, do you exactly. think that there was response to adversity happening because i do resiliency and i think that's a boon for the bears
that oh, yeah. he actually got a head start on what his transition to the NFL needed to look like in part because the team at USC fell apart as badly as they did. Yeah. Well, like you don't even have to go that far. Like even at the end of that USC Notre Dame game, which again, y'all, I was at the game live. Yes, you it were. was rocking. It was, and my dad's a Notre Dame fan. So, you know, I thought that was cool. I didn't know he was going to be, Caleb was going to be a bear at that point. Right. But at the end of that game, Caleb didn't quit. Even when they weren't going to win, he led them down for a touchdown drive. At least one, I remember late. And like, that said a lot more about who he is and finishing something versus you know, people because people want to talk about him in the stands and like all this other stuff on the field. Like, like he would run even if he had to get hit, like because he's a gamer. And the the one thing you were talking about in terms of the fundamentals and how he has uh, different answers for things. If you think of any job, honestly, almost anything in life, we all have problems. Robert, everyone has yes. problems. Problems. It could be financially, could be relationships, could be at the job, could be emergency, whatever. The, the the key to everything in life is being a problem solver. Yes. No matter what's thrown at you, how do I solve this problem? Caleb Williams, why he's the top quarterback, why he's such a special talent, he can problem solve almost anything the defense can throw at you. He's athletic. He has awareness. He can throw from different angles if he somehow gets in a bad angle. He resets in the pocket because like with fields didn't reset. He resets in the pocket. He has that answer. He has great accuracy to all levels of the field. He's not perfect by any means, y'all, but he can solve all these problems. When you just talked about Nick Foles, he can't solve all those problems. Justin Fields couldn't solve all no. those problems. So it's like, I, I feel so much comfort with Caleb because I'm like, wow, he can answer so many different things. And it's just a matter of time before he does it. I agree. And beyond that, Nick, I, I wish more people would say what I'm about to say and what I think you're going to agree with. We should be more comfortable saying out loud, Caleb Williams has growing he needs to do. There are things he was willing to try at USC. Bro, we don't need you to try to make the 35-yard fade throw while you're running to your left. S just reset. Or don't yeah. throw it at all. Like that's, mm -hmm. it, it's fine. Let's get to a more high percentage look than the turnaround fade away 20 foot elbow jumper. That's a low percentage shot. And we need to know not to take that. Does that make sense, Nick? Yeah. Well, like, yeah, what, go ahead. What, 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 what weaknesses do you have of Caleb? So the biggest weakness that I have in Caleb. So there's like a fan weakness, which is me joking about how Caleb's turnovers make the hall of shame consistently there's actually not that many turnovers on a rate base but generally the turnovers you see from Caleb Williams are him rearing the ball back against uh Utah and simply dropping it or him fading away against Notre Dame and not seeing a defender sitting on the sidelines waiting for it like Caleb has the highest rate in terms of his turnovers that I've seen of bro what are you doing and that obviously needs to calm down or fans are gonna freak out right. in the real world nick i could talk about how i'd like to see more consistency within structure i don't yeah. think caleb is as strong anticipatorily as meets the eye mostly because he didn't need it but what i would bubble this all up to including slight recklessness in the pocket love his pocket feel he really thinks he can survive anything back there you can't always survive anything back there know when to take an l let me bubble it all up nick into one phrase right and that's stop trying the stuff you don't think will work in the nfl you need to know it'll work and there's a balance to this because you want the creativity you want caleb to ooze out of his boundaries Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes are perfect examples of guys who, when you watch Josh Allen's Washington or his uh, Wisconsin film, I'm sure you've seen it was Wisconsin. No, it was Wyoming. Wyoming. Gosh, yeah. took me three. But when you watch <laughs> his Wyoming tape, you will see him attempt the same ridiculous things that he does in Buffalo. And guess what? They still work in Buffalo. And same with Texas Tech Patrick Mahomes. People said for a long time that ish isn't going to translate. They did not say ish, right? And yep. what? It did. Who would have thought? So mm -hmm. there's boundaries here. But to me, Nick, the biggest one is Caleb will ignore the need to throw with a platform when he has the space to throw with a platform. 
at times. I'm talking 20 to 30 to 40 yard balls down the field that he's flicking with his feet side to side. They don't need to be side to side. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like whether you need to take an extra hitch or whether you just need to be more precise in the NFL, the ball can't be in a fine place. It kind of needs to be in the perfect place because NFL DBs are much more, I don't know, able but well, your, your your room for error is so much smaller yes. here than it than it is against you know you play Pe- Pepperdine is that my my fun example I used in my last podcast I'll use it here even though I know that I have a a football team or that I know of the 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 ones that I would go with Robert similar to yours is is one would be uh, you want to see more consistency with mm-hmm. you said anticipatory and and within structure you want to see that more just like sure. okay I can do this we know you can do the other stuff like do this more consistently and not like. You have to be the Superman because if you play that, it's going to be such a reckless, up and down, inconsistent kind of offense. Um, the the fumbles and the sacks, you fumbles know, are and, absolutely. And, and I think part of it is how I would describe it to, to y'all is like it's like golfing, and you're like, oh, you know what? I can't keep it in the fairway off my drive, but you know what? You're like in the woods. You're like I can fit between those two little trees right there. And you're like, but you don't need to do that though. You can just pitch it out, and right. then you know, like sometimes it's okay to check it down to Swift or to Cole Komet or just use Keenan Allen because he's always open. Like just do that safe stuff. So I think that would be nice too. Um, and t- to me, the other one is I think I'm a he's a, a good runner. He's um, he's a strong dude. Uh, I don't want to take as many hits either. That, that is a little worry. He does. He will lower his shoulder and do some stuff. It's like, let's He's just got some Baker Mayfield to it. Let's just, right? yeah, let's just preserve your body a little bit, man. So, so to, that, that's the negatives that I, I would think of to me, the best part about Caleb, because we talked about this earlier about how Caleb's not done growing, right? There are mm-hmm. clear growth areas. I mean, the funny part to me, let me get off on a tiny little tangent, Nick, is when I listened. So obviously Justin Fields has been the Bears quarterback for three years. Right. That means people like you and me, we're going to download everything we can about uh, literally and figuratively about Justin Fields analysis from people who know better than us, but also digesting all of the analysis that we can by ourselves in little rooms and chairs in the corner of dark places. Right. As you and I are just thinking through what Fields is and isn't. What got wild to me was how consistent people like Chase Daniel and JD or JT O'Sullivan and Kurt Warner and Dan Orlovsky were about how much they wished they had Justin Fields' athleticism. What it has made me think is Mac Jones at Alabama was extremely precise with where the ball needed to be, but most importantly, when. Mac's sense for timing was really impressive. I thought it oozed out of his tape in 2021. Yeah. Would he have been as precise if he had the option? To do what Fields can do physically. I am starting to believe the answer is no. That part of what we have seen from Caleb and the complaints about his play within structure simply comes from his exponentially larger list of options on any play that a lot of less physically talented quarterbacks don't have. They can't outrun the, the rusher. Caleb can enter an athletic stance that you've seen, I know you have, Nick, where he backpedals. And then he plants hit both of his feet and edge rushers cannot pick up which direction he's going to go. Yeah. And he and will it, just run around him. I'm going to give you an alternative. So uh, I think that the, the reason Mac Jones and like the, uh, the Kirk cousins is, and you know, like that, that era Philip rivers is like that era of quarterback mm-hmm. isn't as effective in this game is because teams play so much too high coverage. It's so much more than they oh, yeah. ever used to that. Now, the athleticism you you gain so much more in terms of buying time if you're mm-hmm. you want to like just manipulate the pocket because they can't bring as many and then you know like minnesota if they do it's gonna be different minnesota's not going to bring as many as they brought against fields y'all so i think that they can't do that as much and then the holes you can run for more so like i think that versus when it was one high yeah we can take the shots down the field or the seams are more open etc i think it's a different game in that you look at the guys that are winning right Mahomes. Allen, Hertz, Jackson, they all have to move and be athletic with your feet, which is why it's so great Caleb has that feature. Absolutely. Not to mention, it gives you that same element we've seen in every Mahomes playoff run, where when they finally get to the playoffs, it's like Mahomes unshackles the running version of himself, and you become an 11th threat in a 10 threat offense. Or, Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take the offensive line out, right, then it's a sixth threat 
that normally the defense is focused on defending mm-hmm. five threats, maybe, right? But even further than this, Nick, because you're talking about what Caleb can do, maybe my favorite part about this, if Caleb Williams was getting drafted by the New York Jets, I would be, or New York Giants, let's stick with the Giants, best example here. He'd look great in the uniform. He'd be an instant star in New York. I would be terrified for him because yes. what lessons would he learn with Wandale Robinson, with Jalen Hyatt, and with, in theory, no other picks for quite some time, and with yeah. the soon-to-be-retired Darren Waller. Mm-hmm. In Chicago, you can tell Caleb through actual, real, immediate game experience. You don't have to put him out there with Kendall Wright, Nick. You don't have to put him out there with, uh, gosh, who was Fields playing? With an Allen Josh Robinson. And- an Allen Robinson that isn't listening to you. Right. You can put Caleb out immediately and you could say, buddy, if you see zone, look for Keenan Allen. If you see man, look for DJ Moore. If you don't like the option, throw it to Cole Komet. And if he's not there, check it down to this guy. That's your starting game plan. And if none of those are there, sure, do whatever you want. But you're going to have to really justify that none of those were there. Well, And And, and and they're both better with scramble rules than the other guys you were already listed. Like, it's different. So in in that same realm, Robert, I'm going to this doesn't have to be a long little thing, but I I have a fun little idea out of nowhere for Ryan Poles that leans into this um, that I I haven't told you about yet. So this is kind of fun, I think. All right. So we know Keenan Allen's a free agent after 2024, right? Right. DJ Moore is a free agent after 2025. Mm -hmm. So here's my idea. We know Justin Jefferson wants the bag, right? (laughs) 30 plus million. I mean, honestly, that might be 34. Like it It might be a ridiculous number. Might be a ridiculous number. In in his class, right? CD Lamb is going to want the bag. Brandon Ayuk, we've already heard about the Niners mm-hmm. wanting to trade him because they can't afford him. T. Higgins just got franchised, and he's lesser, but he's going to get paid. The class after that, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle. Oh, they're coming. Devonta Smith, um, Amon Ross St. Brown, Nico Collins. Like, wide receiver is about to get paid. It's going to go way up. Ryan Poles is a smart dude. Now, I think it might depend on what happens at nine, which we can talk about here in a bit. But I think it's a great idea right now to – offer an extension to DJ Moore and maybe and or Keenan Allen and get them paid before the huge hikes happen. Cause right now DJ Moore is at like 16 million a year, the next two years and sport track has them project had projected like 23 and a half. I know like uh, kind of Mike Evans got like what 21. I mean, and I mean, I mean, it could be projected more, but the real money versus the fake money. But I think getting ahead of that, Robert, could be a huge huge move in keeping this group together for caleb's you know rookie contract it's so funny you mentioned this nick because i don't think i had fully put this together until you just stated those numbers but i was just recently looking at contracts on the line the argument that i was making and i think i made this to you on a podcast not so long ago is that as much as Everybody agrees that center is the most important position on the offensive line. It is definitely not paid like it is the most important position on the offensive line. And intriguingly, that also meant that I can actually tell you how expensive the best and highest paid tackles guards are. Laramie Tunsil's the highest paid lineman in football. You want to guess how much he makes a year? Recent extension, too. Uh, 28? 25. Okay. So if memory serves, it's $25 million. Whereas, I bet you have at least three or four receivers making more than that. Mm-hmm. Could you make the argument, Nick, could you make the argument that a position 10 years ago considered extremely non-premium, 10 years ago considered why would you ever draft one of wide, or a wide receiver in the first round? It never, ever works. Could you make the argument that receiver is becoming a more premium position than offensive tackle. Yes. Uh-huh. 100%. I, what was the podcast I'd listened to? Um, I think, man, was it PFF or it was uh, maybe Trevor Sigma and Con Rogers? I, I like those guys too. I can't remember what it was. And they went through what was the most important ranked positions. It could have been Ben Solak too. By the way, I just named off a bunch of guys I highly respect, listen to any of their stuff. But they went through like okay, quarterback was one. And then it was like receiver tackle, the end, 
was like in that range. And then it was, okay, what else is left after that? You know what I mean? Like obviously running backs later, you know, tight end might be in that guard range, you know, like they, cause they talked about nothing has, has improved as much in terms of the salary, Robert, which you're talking about as right tackle within the last three or four years. Like that number is almost matched and then, and, and went up like, I think like 160% or something crazy from what it used to be. So I, I agree with you. And that's also why I really want Roma Dunze at 109 or Malik Neighbors. Both are phenomenal prospects. There are, Nick, there is one. Okay, there is Tyree Kill, Devonta Adams, Cooper Cup, AJ Brown, Stefan Diggs, DK Metcalf, and Debo Samuel all making more money than every lineman, I think. Let me quickly check right tackle real fast. Uh, yeah, every lineman in football other than Laramie Tunsil. Yeah, because they're, they're at 24, right? That's what DK is? Uh, they're all, they're, one of them's at like 23 and yeah, it, like 0.83. But yeah. then you add the fact that when it comes to wide receiver, gosh, I would have to actually count to get all the way down to Chris Godwin, who's making 20 a year, right? Michael Pittman is fine. Like, I, I'm not trying to make you fight me or something like that. Michael well, Pittman. I like Michael Pittman. But do you he's like not, him 23? Do you like him 23 and a third million dollars a year? Well, I mean, I mean. 23 and a, a third. 23 yeah, and a third as, million as a dollars a year. wide receiver, too. Yeah. That's a, that's a WR2 now? Is, <laughs> like, again, that is more money than I think, uh, other than two linemen, every lineman in ball. Like, the wide receiver position is quickly becoming extra super premium like that's well, well, where we well, stand why? why what happened with Tua once he got Tyreek what Shocker. happened to Jalen Hurts once he got AJ brother look you can connect all these dots to get that passing game cruising you need the weapons I mean Nick, and, and people I'll, say Mahomes but you had Kelsey so like that he has Kelsey. Nick I'll take you a step further I think Joe Burrow has been good I think Drew, Joe Burrow has been an exceptional brand I don't know if Joe Burrow reaches anywhere near the highs he's reached now in terms of like considered a top five quarterback, a bona fide. There was a point where people said, I would rather have Joe Burrow than any other quarterback in the league if I was starting a franchise today. Does he get there? It was was Burrowhead, remember? Mm -hmm. Like they owned the Chiefs, remember that? Does does he get any of those accolades? I'm asking honestly, without adding Jamar Chase to this pie. I don't, I don't think so. And I, and I like Joe Burrow y'all like, that's not me. Cause we need to, and I've talked, I have, yeah, this isn't Joe Burrow this. hate. This is because it's tough, Robert, to, to put a value on a quarterback without looking at their situation and their line and everything, yes. because like you could look at anywhere and you're like, well, this quarterback is a bust, but you're like, Justin, we just went through this with Justin Fields. When you have nobody to throw to and your line is bad, it's like, how do we make that this equal as having Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle? Like, it's impossible. Right. It's a really tough, like, needle to thread. To use mm-hmm. an example, one of my soft spots, I don't know why, but I've always thought Daniel Jones is underrated. I am not telling you I think he's good. There are people that just think he's unrosterable. Right. And I look at this 2023 edition of the Giants and I'm like, OK, so who's who's the best receiver on the week one 2023 Giants? It was really awful out there. Yeah. We're talking Darius Slayton is probably your go to guy. And the line somehow got worse despite all the money they tried to spend. Whoa. If you put any of your favorite quarterbacks on the 2023 Giants, we are all saying that team is terrible. Why would you expect this quarterback to be playing well? Right. Mm-hmm. But we don't say that because we don't like Daniel Jones. <laughs> but no, no, exactly. The, well, the yeah, situation well, we, matters. They, they didn't like him when he came out, but people hated Josh Allen. And that took a while to overcome that and win them over. So it's, it is. Speaking, I mean, speaking, like, speaking of Nick, speaking of Nick. Ooh, right, no, no, can I ask I you a no question? Yeah. I, I more wanted to say, okay, so I'll give you two options, right? One is a disgruntled receiver that still thinks he's the absolute man. You need to spend a second round pick to get him. And you definitely only get him for one year. In fact, you actually axed down his contract so that he could hit free agency in a year. Uh, Another option, you can get a similarly aged receiver that actually produced more 
in that same time frame. He's about as healthy as he's been in a little while's time. He's coming over with a, certainly a high opinion of himself. Don't get me wrong, but he he hasn't openly hated playing with the second best quarterback in football, and it cost you a pick in the fourth round. Uh, which deal do you think is better, Stephon Diggs or Keenan Allen? I mean, that's that's a I mean, home run, Ryan pulls y'all. I mean, even in the interviews, you've I don't know if you've seen those recently. He's like, yeah, I didn't even know that was on the table. Like that came out of nowhere. The so I, easily Keenan Allen because it's cheaper and because he's a better locker room presence. I mean, that was the issue with Stephon Diggs in Minnesota. And we're seeing some, I mean, Buffalo gave him away, essentially. That's what it seems like here in a, in a contender window. And here's a, here's further proof PFF. Again, we, we reference them all the time as a neutral party. So we're not biased here. Keenan Allen's wide receiver grade last year, 87.4. Stefan Diggs was 8.4 points less at 79 overall. Which is still a good player. Yeah. That's a good player. It's not a near elite player, according to PFF. And I mean, look, Nick, I would say you and I are pretty critical. There was a long time where we would not say a single nice word about Matt Eberflus, which I understand, like, that's a popular thing on most Bears podcasts. But it's more to say that right now, I just think the Bears are kind of on a heater. And Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, there's a lot of things that have broken in their favor. But I mean, DeAndre Swift. I thought the DeAndre Swift deal was a major overpay, dot, 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 until I saw the rest of the running back deals. Yeah. I thought the Keenan Allen trade might have been a little bit expensive. This makes it look quite inexpensive. This is that feeling, Nick, of somebody jumps on a house and it's where they paid more for it than you think they should have until their neighbor pays $50,000 yep. more than that for pretty much the same house. And you yep. go, oh, you got this cheap, didn't yeah. you? Well, so so leaning back into my thing, mm-hmm. do you think that Poles can stay in this heater and extend before the market gets crazy? I I think he's going to try. I think it's a question of whether DJ Moore feels like being reasonable. And if I yeah. was DJ, or if I was Ryan Poles, to be honest with you, I would probably want to wait one more season. Not because I hate myself, but because DJ Moore is probably going to be in a relatively bad mood until you prove to him that this thing in Chicago is going to work. Right. Like DJ Moore seems to really like Justin Fields. I don't blame him. The guy just delivered DJ the best season of his life. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea of starting over with a rookie quarterback. Well, unfortunately, DJ's been there. (laughs) So Keenan could tell DJ stories about, no, 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 man, don't worry. When Justin got to Los Angeles, we were fine. The guy could play immediately. And DJ's going to be like, don't talk to me about young quarterbacks. I've seen I've seen some really bad. I, ones. I don't know. They they gotta have a lot more hope with. I mean, this is the first pick. He's maybe, bad. but they're grown adults that are going to be depending on a twenty two year old that apparently Jalen Johnson thinks has Hollywood in him. So there, yeah. you got to remember these players don't have the time to study like we do for their teammates. Which is not to say they're not going to watch film. It's more to say like they're going to meet the guy. He's going to be like I mean. Nick, it is literally like if you got a head coaching job and then the school that offered you that head coaching job brought in a hot shot that's eight years younger than you. And they mm-hmm. said, this guy's going to be your offensive coordinator. Are you just because he might be good? Like, are you going to come around eventually? But what is your yeah. immediate first impression of him? It's probably why are we doing this? That's it. Yeah. Not I don't like him. Just right. a little bit of discomfort. And yeah. but I yeah. do think to your point trying to extend him ought to be on the table. Mm. I just don't know if they, like, I think that maybe the bears are hoping that they'll get a hometown discount from some of their guys. If they make Chicago a super bowl trajectory team and it, it might not be there in the locker room yet, but you give this thing what you and I, Nick hope is nine games in the 2024 season. I bet it's going to start feeling that way. Oh, man. It's, it, it, I mean, we, we, at the end of our last podcast, we were getting, we were getting the heater mode of getting excited. And I, I think there's a lot of reason to, and because one of the reasons, Robert, as I transition, and this can be a, a short segment if we want, well, that is be, a sweet transition. Is, if you, if you're is, going where is, I think you're going 109, y'all, it's going <laughs> to be a segue of segues. It's, it's one of the it's best in our be, history. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I'm, we're good on the heater too. 109, there's going to be some talent there. So 
the, from what I, I see, the options are going to be Odunze or Neighbors. Likely Odunze would fall off any of the three receivers. Offensive line, I wrote down Alt or Fashanu. Do you think any other O lineman they would consider? The Bears? Yeah. I don't know. The funny part here is, Nick, I could understand the Bears. So the Bears spent huge money on Jermaine Edmonds. In the draft so far, we have seen polls almost only target, actually, yeah, only target premium positions outside of Jaquan Brisker. That is pretty much the only pick that wasn't a corner, a defensive lineman, or a important other position like a like Darnell Wright, etc. Mm-hmm. It's not like we have a million picks to fall back on. Yep. But in the higher rounds of the draft, we've seen him target positions that get paid an awful lot. Mm-hmm. So does he think Fuaga would be a sweet right guard? Maybe. Does he think Fuaga's a blue chipper? Maybe. Would the Bears drafting a guy who ends up having the career arc of Quentin Nelson be a bad pick at nine? Probably not, but literally anything worse than that, immediate yes, right? Like, that's the gamble when you take a a non-premium position. But it's funny, because you mentioned, I mean, I think there are guys in the league that are going to love Latham. Like, love Latham. And so... And and by the way, coached against that guy. Oh, you did? Was he just a beast then, too? Didn't I tell you this story? I don't think he did. All right, so uh, his freshman year of high school, y'all, he's already, you know, 6'6", 280, oh and, he played, and he played D-end, and we played him in the playoffs. He played okay? D-end? Yeah, he played him at D-end, and I, I was the offensive coordinator, okay? W- what am I going to call? Like, I mean, obviously, he's the best player <laughs> on their team, but, like, they have they have a squad. They're ranked first in the state, and my, I obviously couldn't get the ball moving. A lot of our guys were afraid. Here's like my first first down, Robert. He was a freshman. The nose tackle was like a freshman or sophomore. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go on two. It was like third and four. I'm like, they're going to be excited and jump off sides. They jumped off sides. That's how I got my first first down. I was like, yes, I got the superstar to jump off sides. And that's that's how I moved the ball to start with. It was terrible, but good kid, you know. But But also, I see him as a right tackle. And like you're saying, like guard, it would be nice, but they're premium like if you move down in round one i can see that so Mm -hmm. like moving on here so turner verse latu like we talk about those dns and then your favorite guy is a d tackle and byron murphy do you want to dive into him both of them to be honest with you like okay so nick i have to admit something to the world of chicago i admitted it like two and a half hours into a stream so if you didn't hear it like i don't blame you those are long but nick i heard everybody hyping up Johnny Newton, Jerzon Newton, if you want to use his actual name. Yep. And I assumed it was your normal Chicago loves their Chicago guy bluster, right? Because I've, I've seen this. Adam Hogue, love Adam Hogue, great analyst, fought the good fight for Peter Skaronsky until the d- day of the draft. And immediately the NFL said, he is not a tackle. We are playing him at guard. Like immediately. They couldn't have been faster at just he's a guard and Mm -hmm. that so because of this i thought people were overselling johnny newton Mm -hmm. they aren't overselling johnny newton that guy's a stud the biggest question about him is is his medical chart as good as his tape because he obviously had a jones fracture that got an operation only recently that's Mm -hmm. an injury that can take a lot of explosiveness away from defensive linemen because of the weight that those guys carry on a down-to-down basis. So I do think there's two defensive tackles that are in play here. And the question I'll ask you, Nick, is do you think, because I don't know how you feel about the DTs, do you think those guys might be better pass rushers than any of the edges in this class? That's a good question, man. Um, I philosophically i would prefer my d tackles to be the pass rushers Wouldn't so you? from that one i agree with you i think i would put i would stack it law to then i think murphy. he's the best pass rusher and yep. the then, then biggest murphy. outside question mark yeah yeah and then and then murphy i think i would put law to above murphy but i think murphy's second for me in pass rushing period mm-hmm. if the other thing about murphy i was talking to mason west for those who don't know him Right. He's a doctor and a physical therapist uh, that also hosts Bare Bones to IR and back again 
on the Second City Gridiron podcasting channel, RIP Vox Media. They just cut all of their podcasts. Massive yeah. shame, if you ask me. Um, but so, anyways, I was talking to Mason about uh, Latu, and he said, I would not go near him. I was like, Mason, what? Wow. And he said, he said, there's only one player that I can think of that ever played with a fused vertebra in the neck, which is what they did with Latu, and he just retired after five years. Can you name the player, Nick? Ooh. No, I can't. It's Leighton Vander Esch. Every oh, other that's player right. that's ever dealt with this did not ultimately play. Because they both have that, that thing behind their neck, that, that, yes. that little thing, yeah. Does this mean Law 2 is an immediate bust? I don't know. I'm not a doctor, right? Yeah. But the only doctor I know that is also as into football as I am is saying, do not go near that. And hmm. I thought that was really interesting because if you feel like I do, Nick, the pass rush tape is pretty plain as day on oh, who's the best pass rusher here. It's so smooth. <laughs> Talk about having answers, man. His hands are so good. He just beats everybody. And there's something else, Nick, that I, while we're in this conversation, I want to wrap back to because you couldn't have teed it up more perfectly. You said JC Latham is playing defensive end. You said he's an outstanding pass rusher. Moreover, you said, as an offensive coordinator, what was I supposed to call? Yep. One pass rusher, let alone multiple, can affect a game plan so heavily that mm -hmm. I'll tell you, Bears fans, some good news and bad news, Nick. I'll give you two things to chew on, and then I want you to just go on them, right? Mm -hmm. The bad news. The more that Jer Daniel Jeremiah and Lance Zerline and anybody writing a mock draft at all continues to list Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze at number nine. The more I think the neon lights at number eight light up and say, if you want a wide receiver, Jacksonville. If you want a wide receiver, Los Angeles. If you want a wide receiver, yeah. Buffalo. You're going up to eight. And mm -hmm. I worry, because the other part of this, Nick, is normally – uh, I'm sitting here making an argument for Jackson Smith Jigba at number nine. I literally did this last year. So I love wide receivers. Yeah. In this case, in this rare case, the wide, the three wide receivers are top six players. If we're going off of any objective standard, they are the BPA. There's, <laughs> there's, there's so much better than the, the Jigba. So I, much oh, better. Oh, drastically. I'm saying in this draft class, do you think that they're any lower than sixth? Like the no. third one? No. Nope. I don't think so either. So it feels like this is an immovable object, which is historically this never happens. Going up against an unstoppable force of, by definition, it probably should. So the bad news is, I think that there's a very real chance that the Bears get boxed out of a receiver at number nine and have to settle for the best defensive player on their board. The good news is, I think these DTs are such good pass rushers that you can inflict that same mental damage state that Nick was just talking about. Because if Byron Murphy or Johnny Newton plus Montez Sweat plus Andrew Billings becomes a new rule of three type, Caleb has to score one less touchdown every single game. I mean... So, 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 so you're... I just want to get your stance, okay? Officially, right? So people can write this all down, right? Yes. If one of the receivers are there... Yeah, I think you have to take him. Okay, so so we're on the same page. They have it, to take because because to me, I think you know insulating Caleb is the goal. But you're saying if all three are gone, and you're not going to pivot to Brian Thomas Jr. or another receiver, it's kind of the same argument, Nick, that we were making about Justin Fields Caleb. Where granted, if I didn't believe it, then I couldn't be resolute about it on a podcast. So I get that, right? That there's sort of a a both and. But this is less opinion, and it's almost more, Nick. What do you do in the draft? You take the best positional value you possibly can. Well, according mm. to contracts right now, receiver is one of the literal most valuable positions yeah. in the sport. Yep. Also, you would be taking best player available, which is a known thing you're supposed to do. Also, mm -hmm. you'd be adding an elite receiver talent to grow alongside a rookie quarterback that the entire organization, all the way up to George McCaskey, is betting their legacy on. So all the pieces, like... You could get strike one, strike two, down to strike six for yep. why you take the receiver if they're there. I think right. the only reason you don't is <laughs> if they're not there. And yeah. I'm beginning to think that there's a very realistic shot. They won't be. Just because yeah. if we're this excited about it, would it stand to reason? So is the rest of the league. Well, I mean, the, the league is, is quarterback hungry. 
And the one thing that we underrate as fans is we don't we don't talk about offensive line as much as the league does. They no, we love don't. linemen, and this is a great line class. And yes, I, it is. I mean, like last year, do we think Paris Johnson was going to go as high as he did? You know, like th- there's a lot of stuff with that. So I do want to. This kind of ties into my 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 top thirty visits thing. Okay, mm-hmm. so the we don't know all of them, y'all, but we know the ones that we know. So te- teams that are local, like Northwestern, Illinois, Notre Dame, Michigan, etc., they they don't count within this top thirty. Those are like free ones, whatever. And here, before I list the ones that are on the top thirty list, there are four last year on this whatever. We didn't even get all top 30. We got like top 20 last year from Chicago. Tyreek Stevenson came in for a visit. Darnell Wright came in for a visit. Tyler Scott and Jervon Dexter. All of them came in for visits. And man, those were all Bears picks. So you think of like, these aren't indicators or guys they like. I mean, most time it is. So Caleb Williams came in. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, No running backs. Brock Bowers and Ben, is it Sinnott or Sinat? We both Mm -hmm. like. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, and Jaquan Jackson. I don't know him. I haven't followed him. Tulane receiver. He's yeah, a spark plug. He, okay. he was the best small guy at the senior bowl. In particular, oh, okay. he had a really second or a really good second day of practice. How, the, how big is he? Not big. I mean, I would literally have to pull out my, you know, okay, what well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going Stall for time and I'll get yeah, you the measurables. Uh, so, so O line, um, Quran. Abnigje, the uh, tackle from Yale, uh, Trevor Keegan, Graham Barton, Tyler Guyton, and Zach Frazier. DN's Dallas Turner, Chop Robinson, which is interesting, y'all. Those two came in for visits. Jared Verse and Latu did not come in for visits. And then corners, Nehemiah Pritchard, or Pritchett, um, Andrew Phillips, and Elijah Jones. So those are the 30 visits that we know. And then there are some from Notre Dame and Illinois schools as well. I was going to say, because there's no way Cam Hart didn't come in for a visit. Yeah, that yeah, guy, he came in, yeah, but he's, that guy, he's got bears written all over the corner. Yep, I mean, yep. so Jaquan Jackson, by the way, 5'9", 190 with, oh. I, I could read the rest, but. No, so, well, 190 is fine for me, as long as you got that thickness. Yeah. Yep, it, yep. it is interesting too because so as I was going through, I'm writing a series for DVB. I don't know how many days it'll take me, just because I want to make sure the articles are good more so than just kicking something out every day. But mm-hmm. in researching verse, dude, I didn't realize he was 23. The way people talked about him, I expected him to be younger than that. And no, because well, he was at Albany, and then he went back last year. Totally, so. but it's more to say that a 23 year old man dominating college football with nearly no Ben to speak of. Well, that's a little less impressive than a 21-year-old with all kinds of room to be coached. It's also interesting just because I... Okay, Nick, here's my question, all right? So I'm doing this pro... uh, Basically, if Jacksonville offered you 17, 48, and a 2025 second, would you trade off Roma Dunze for that? All right, give me me it again. Because I I thought it was going to be another thing. Give me it again. uh, I'm doing a pro football network mock, right? Yeah. And they and Jacksonville at 17 offers me uh, 17, 48, 2025, 2. The question I'm asking you, because just to give you an explanation while you think about it, I'm literally going to stall for time. I, I, I got my answer, but it's up to you if you want to. Is that is 115% of the charted value for yeah. that pick. This is an overpay. Yeah. When we talk about trade downs, Sometimes you may be able to swing a deal. It takes two to tango. If all the good players get picked, I mean that tongue in cheek, then the Bears yeah. may not have a lot of great options trading down. Would you sell your rights to Roma Dunze for blatant overvalue? Uh, my answer is no. And the, the reason is because, and I've done this, and this is where I struggle with the trade down, get value uh, part of Bears Twitter, is I don't love. Guys at 17. I don't love guys at 20. I don't love guys at 25. Like it's like, Neither okay, I'll take Brian Thomas if he's there and hope he develops into a route runner, which he hasn't yet. I'll take, you know, people love Jackson Powers Johnson. Like, okay, but it's a center. I want a premium positions. I don't, you know, the so I get into that area. And instead of doing that, I'll go the guy who could be 
a Jamar Chase level or another Keenan Allen level guy for my rookie quarterback. I'm going to go that route. But I have I have another pivot with this. Okay, so give it to me. Polls said in the press conference, we're going to have a team of guys going offensive tackle, team of guys talk at the end, team of guys going to go receiver. Right? They're going to and go over scenarios. He did not say D tackle, Robert, as well as if we look at these top 30 visits. Now, again, these guys could be included. I don't know. Joe Alt isn't in this list of guys. I don't see uh, Olu Vishanu there. Uh, the tackles and, and guys there would be, I think, if they move down late one, early round two, any of those alignment. Uh, no D tackles are there. I don't even see Newton in this list. And, he wouldn't be, though, right? And and, and Verse and Lots who aren't there. So right there, I think that right there says they're going to go with potentially y'all Brock Bowers, one of the receivers or Dallas Turner. That is your group of guys at nine. And I don't think it's anybody else. I still think to myself, Nick. So when I watched Byron Murphy, Byron is short that much. Absolutely. His Mm -hmm. arms are not all that long, but every other testing metric is very impressive. And for his height, I expected him to be thinner. He's not. He's about 300 pounds, which is roughly where you'd want a three tech to be anyways, if not actually about 10 pounds lighter than a lot of these NFL guys play. I digress. The main thing, Nick, that I find myself thinking with guys like Byron Murphy, just to get this stated, this time last year, Darnell Wright was still a late first round pick. Mm -hmm. Go back a month from where we are today. He was a second round pick. Go back a month from that point. He was a fourth round pick. And slowly but surely he works his way up to number 10 right i will tell you that i get the ceiling on dallas turner i'm not stupid right i mean his long arm is nasty he's extremely athletic he's improving year over year there's a lot to like about dallas turner i also think we're underrating the d tackles purely because nobody's rated him highly yet right Trevor Sikema just redid his board. He's got Jerzon Newton at number 8th overall. He's got Byron Murphy at number 13th overall. And that's not to say these are law. It's more to say, Nick, how much of our understanding of where you'll get these tackles is groupthink. Because I think when you watch the impact they have on games, I think Dallas Turner was good. He did not lead his defense the way Johnny Newton did. I think Johnny Newton is amazing in part because he played almost double the snaps that uh, that Byron Murphy did. But when Murphy was in the game, at times he looked unblockable, which is its own amazing trait. So I'm with you in theory, Nick. But also, isn't this the same GM that gave us the smokescreen on Jalen Carter for a month straight, <laughs> only to trade off of him? Like, at what point, honest asking, honestly asking, at what point around this time of year do we just not trust Ryan Bulls on what he says? Yeah, I, but I, I trust everything with him, though. I just trust him to make the decision. I did it at quarterback. No, you're 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 right on that one with Darnell Wright. I did this quickly just because it was interesting to me. Are, let me ask you a quick question. Are you an ageist with prospects, Robert? Depends I know you on the position. With, okay. I well, was which, so which ones in- matter to you? So I was so interested to see. So I've been working with Start Kyle Orton on Twitter, uh, but also I saw Tej Smith talk about this just the other day, that there's nothing more indicative of quality of a quarterback prospect than their age, if you can believe it. The the basic gist on what Kyle has come to. Breakout age? It is. It is effectively breakout age, but it kind of comes down to this idea, Nick, of if you got it, you proved it sooner. And if you don't got it, you might have had a good season, but it may have taken a minute for that to happen. And this is the is is this the Jane Daniels talk real quick? I don't want to go there. I'm I'm kidding. Can I say how thankful I am, by the way, that we don't have to have that discussion? Not because I hate Jane Daniels, but look at Broncos fans, dude. Broncos fans have to talk themselves into Michael Penix, who I think has ability, very niche in terms of what he can do. But or Bo Nix, who also niche in what he can do. Or you've got Giants fans who uh, one of my best friends in the industry, Bobby Skinner, major talk of Giants guy at John Boy mm-hmm. Media. He loves Drake May and he wants it to happen so badly. Nick, yeah. it's, it's not going to happen. Well, right. Th- th- let me pull you back, though. So the, the age thing. OK. Yes. 
is so Johnny Newton turns 22 in August. Like Dude is 22. August. Doesn't he? Th- don't you think he's 23? Like, doesn't your brain oh, tell yeah. you he's turning 24? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, I always thought he was older. Uh, Byron Murphy turns 22 September 8th. So those two are like within nine days of each other, the birthdays. They're really young, really Dallas, young dudes. Dallas Turner turned 21 in February, this past right. February. And then so, when so, did Jared Verse turn 21? Oh my gosh. 2004. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'll, I'll look it up. When did um, Layatu Latu turn 21? Yeah, they're they're both old. They're, they're 23. both 23. Yeah. So no, no, November. He Verse turned 24 in November. And so like... And that's the other part of this, y'all. Is like there's a like with Caleb, we talked about this. There's a projection, like how how are they going to be, and then what? How can they improve? And like with Turner, he's so young. You're projecting a lot of how much he's going to develop. Does that work? Does that not work? There's boom bust with all of that. And so I think that's part of the conversation. But let me ask you this, to Robert. If you're sitting there, and the receivers are gone, and you can't trade down, and it's Turner versus murphy or newton who are you picking i haven't watched turner recently enough so i don't want to let recency bias bias spoil this mm-hmm. what i will say the byron murphy you see at texas could be an immediate contributor in a chicago uniform might get smoked in the run game but in the past game he will make an impact he is too hard to block but nick he also only played 44% of defensive snaps because Texas had a rotation. You never saw him tired. You didn't see him at the back end of a 9-12 to 12 play defensive drive having to gear up for a fourth down. He did not think he was going to have to play. Who, who was the guy that was right next to him? He was decent too, wasn't he? Tavondre Sweat. He was <laughs> sweet in his own right and somebody I would love for the Bears to be looking at. But with Turner... You, I think that the player that you draft is going to not make the instant impact that Murphy will, but he could grow into a really sweet player. I will tell you, Nick, that I have already been through this with Leonard Floyd, so I am a little on the worried yeah. side that he doesn't ever take that next step. But side note, if the Bears added rookie deal Leonard Floyd to this defense, that is a boost. Like that is in and of itself. Wasn't Leonard Floyd like 23 coming out, but he's super skinny. Was he? I mean, I would literally have to go look this up. I thought he was older when he came out. I remember being probably 19 at that time. Uh, I was, no, I was like 21. I was like the other, the other part with this to me is like, if you go D end, Uh it's, we we obviously know the other side and it's going to be Walker and him rotating but Walker can kick inside and play three tech and rush along with the other group. You got no one else at the end. And so in terms of like positional scarcity value, Turner makes the most sense to me. So the other part to me, I'm glad we're having this conversation. This is a great one to wrap on, by the mm-hmm. way, is I like Gravon Dexter. I think what Gravon Dexter showed us in his rookie year was actually more than I expected as a pass rusher, mm-hmm. less than I expected as a run defender. Right now, Nick, from one tech, three tech, and the edge, Gravon Dexter is a situational pass rusher that we would love to see grow into a better run defender, and he should. Most really athletic defensive linemen don't suck against the run forever. That's just kind of a a given in the NFL, right? But it's funny, because if you told me, Nick, that we could ask Gervon Dexter, this is me thinking outside the box, and I get it, but walk with me. Oh, don't, don't, the end again? If we... Ask no. Ron Dexter to Stop. lose 15 pounds. You're no. telling me, dude, no. he cooked Panay Sewell on a no. one-on-one rush. No. Why do we not want to tap into this? Well, why not keep him at D tackle? Have him be this awesome three tech. Like, that's the thing is like, if do you have a rotation. He's an awesome, do we know he's an awesome three tech? Not yet. Do we know he's an awesome D end? Definitely not. But I have a D end there. So if the experiment doesn't work. You have Demarcus Walker, who I think we could both want better for him. But if you get a sick three technique, then here's my question, okay? Dallas Turner and Byron Murphy both end up Hall of Famers, okay? Mm -hmm. Hooray. Now, let's walk it back a little. They just end up very, very good, all right? Who do you think is the better line immediately? And I'm asking you to take, take your... Try to take as much as you can. Your fan glasses off. The 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 what the better was basically the who's the best weak link on the line? Is it Gravon Dexter? You're two. 
or is it Demarcus Walker? Oh, it, it, it's DN easy because... Walker can play D tackle, but plus you have Pickens who you invested too. So like, I think if you go D tackle there, you're basically wasting away. I know they're going to rotate. I get that. Who's rotating at the end? I mean, it was like, well, they don't have anybody yet. That's for I sure. Mean, I mean, I mean, Robinson is one of the worst DNs in no, the NFL. Please like, yeah, don't resign Yannick either. Like oh. it, I completely get where you're coming from. I don't think you're wrong, by the way. Like I, I am in a true state of, there's not really a wrong answer. And whatever Ryan Poles goes with, I am never going to, at a moment in my career, Nick, sound more agreeable, I think, than whatever the Bears choose to do at nine. Because mm-hmm. I am in a total state. This is, I guess, my final thought of the pod. Like, sure. I'm in a true state of pretty much anything that the Bears do will make the team better. If they reach on OT4 at number nine, I might be a little frustrated. I just don't think they're going to. There's too many good players for them not to at least trade down a little bit if they really want Fawaga. In the ROI on, on Braxton Jones's contract is just so good right now. Like, right. So, yeah. But if they decide that Byron Murphy is the future engine of their defense, here for it. If they decide Dallas Turner is the missing piece that they think the defense needs, here for it. If they basically tell you without telling you, Nick, they don't think Gervon Dexter is ready for it, I love the foresight. If they tell me that they trust Gervon Dexter and he delivers, super here for it. That's how you use the draft. Like, I'm so agreeable. What I don't want to see is the defense get invested in, but also have some massive weak link. And while I know you're thinking right now, well, wouldn't the second edge be that? I'm sitting here thinking interior pressure is worth like a pressure and a half compared to edge pressure. So if I if I have the choice between. Yeah. I agree. If I have the choice between where I'm going to get my penetration, I would prefer it up the middle. And I, I guess the other thing that that why I really want more edge pressure in my mind is I'm so annoyed with the Green Bay's outside zone <laughs> and boot game that if you had two guys with huge long arms that are super athletic, it really, really stops that attack and limits what they can do. And yeah, I mean, I get it. But the other part too is if I if I was going D tackle at nine, I want a guy to keep blockers off of my linebackers that aren't good at that. I don't think Murphy's that either. So no. I think it's kind of a two for one for me. It, it is funny because the Bears have some options. I think that you and I would agree, Nick, that if the draft, if it goes in some order, let's go with number one, Bears take Caleb. Number two, Washington takes May. Number three, uh, why, uh, let's go with the Giants, send it, they draft Daniels, right? <clears throat> Arizona trades out of four. Mini comes up. They take McCarthy, right? Yep. At five, they, what is it? The Chargers trade down. I'm going to go with the most popular answer possible. That's fine. That's Chargers fine. trade down with Arizona, who comes back up to with take Harrison. Marvin Harrison. Yeah. Then at six, the now Patriots Patriots. take neighbors. And then sure. at seven, uh, Tennessee takes alt, and then at eight, the Falcons put up the for sale sign. They sell yep. it to somebody, walks up and takes a Dunze. Mm-hmm. If all this happens, yeah, of course, we wish that the player that the Bears had access to was just a little better, right? There is debate. Don't you yep. prefer somebody that's clear cut? Don't you? Yeah. I do. 100%. But also, if they take the best defender, I don't have an issue with this. Like, that's the literal best defender in the class doesn't automatically make them the star, but I think there's value there because if you can create a defense, here's, I guess, my big take, Nick, is if you can create a defensive line that is not only injury resistant because we never saw Montez Sweat get hurt, so we never saw the defensive line immediately gear shift back into the Mm -hmm. early form, but also the secondary is too good to waste them on a unit that can't get any pressure. You add a little more pressure playmaking to this. Ooh, that gets my gears turning on how many times TJ Edwards can jump in front of that short pass or okay. how aggressive Jalen Johnson can play downfield. My favorite one to think about, I think if you gear up the pressure a little bit, uh, Kyler Gordon is the guy who benefits the most because I think you can play him all over the place and that quarterbacks will lose him. Like in the traffic of where is Byron Murphy? Where is Montez Sweat? 
is Andrew Billings about to eat me? It would be very <laughs> easy to lose sight of that small little nickel corner that yeah. drifted into a robber spot, unbeknownst yeah. to you. Yeah. And, and and like all these young guys are going to like, I mean, in theory, get improve a little bit, you know, like Brisker and you were talking about like those guys too. And like if they all improve a little bit, but then you had the pass rusher, like you're saying, like I think it just goes another level. <coughs> I love it, man. What is um, your final take? Well, my, my final take is is I wanted to just highlight, um, you know, Bears fans. Like if they trade down, um, there's one guy I think that would be in, in late or early round two. Um, I really, really love Lad Makaki. Oh, I yeah. mean, I mean, and the thing is, is I think people look at him and like, oh, he's just a slot receiver. Like he can win outside. He's the same size and athleticism as uh, Garrett Wilson. And he's got great ball skills. He separates. And I mean, I think he would just be so much fun to have. And I know you want to have the big X opposite of all of this kind of stuff. But I mean, beggars can't be choosers. And if you have three guys that separate and can win against like anything, it'd be a lot of fun. I just think he's very underrated among what people think he is. Um, I think he's just a fantastic football player. It's funny to me, Nick, because I think McConkey will be there in the late second, not because of good reasons. I know. No I know. Late no. second? You would have said the same thing about Josh Downs, wouldn't you? I, Do you think he, Josh Downs would be there in the mid-third? No. No, but you I, didn't. Because you have an yeah. eye for good football players. And the NFL cares about your height, your speed, your weight. And Lad he McConkey. Four, three, nine, I think. McConkey I know. Did. So he passes the speed check, as yeah. did Josh Downs, who ran like a 4-4. He's like 5'11 and change, like 189 or something. Mm -hmm. He's a little small. He's a little light. And he has an injury history. And I yeah. think that's going to make Lad McConkey a great value pick in that like mid to late second. And if worst case you end up with, like if you're trading down to me, Lad McConkey, Ricky Pearsall, Jalen Polk are great options to pick up in the second round that I think would be quite exciting. Not near as exciting as Roma Dunze. No. Not near as exciting. Did, did you? But, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go. I, I was just even just going to say, man, like I'm asking you this. I'm asking you very upfront. How far do you think the drop off is from your excitement about BTJ, Brian Thomas Jr., and your excitement about somebody like McConkey? Not much. I think they're pretty similar. Yep. Like maybe once you get down to the Pearsall air angle, I'd go, ah, probably more excited about Brian Thomas. Yep. But even then, a full round's worth of excitement? I don't actually know about that. No. Whereas <laughs> if you if also speaking of, I understand he's a project. But if you did take Chop Robinson and you also got a sweet receiver, I also think I'm not gonna whine that they didn't get verse because they got Chop. I think Chop is an underrated super fluid athlete like that is a bad football player love you he, he's raw though that is a really bad football player that is a really wild athlete that yeah. could become an insane football yeah. player yeah, he's a project i um and, and i guess my last thought would be this is um marcus uh Mosier, um uh he's a friend we were talking he had his, his good dude draft. yeah yeah good dude um, oh yeah, he is he in Texas? He's a Cowboys fan. Oh, I have no idea. If, yeah, I know he's a Cowboys fan. Yeah, so I'm sure he's around somewhere. Yeah, but anyways, in his mock today, he had the Bears trading up their first next year to go from nine to five to get Marvin Harrison Jr. I I think it's too expensive because I don't think they have to pay the quarterback tax to move up. Um, because it was the top four quarterbacks are going to go. I'll say this though. I don't hate it. <coughs> I just don't because, it, I mean, you add that in a, on a cheap rookie deal with Caleb, like you just instantly, you know, Caleb's going to be very good. Like, I, I, I don't, I couldn't see how he fails. I know it sounds bad. And then, you know, Harrison's, I mean, such a high, high, high floor. And it's like, dude, that's just like, yeah, I know you have the one next year, but I feel like that's going to be a mid to late first. I, Nick would be in Terry Fontenot's ear. And I would say, if they call, hang up the phone. I will give you a third next year, and you can talk me into Chicago's second. To just get eight. Like, if I have to pick between my first next year for Marvin Harrison, 
mm-hmm. or my second next year for Roma Dunze, mm-hmm. I think the value's there to just go up to eight and lock this thing in, right? Man, that's expensive. To move up of course it's expensive. I'd rather pay the third, wouldn't yeah. you? Like, yeah. I, mean, I mean, well, the, the chart last year was only a fourth to go from Eagles to go from 10 to nine for a player that clearly only like one team wanted. I don't, <laughs> right? you, can't, you don't know that. I mean, you they could have thought that. anybody. He was point. the best that's a good player point. in the draft. Hey, that's a good point. Falling, so. more, more to say, Nick, that if I'm Ryan Poles, the only trade up I'm thinking about is trading to eight and just getting that third receiver and saying, nobody, no phone calls, no phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm overstating my point. By saying my 2025 second, everybody listening should go, Robert, that's way too expensive. But the hope is it doesn't come to that. Like the hope is that you could, I mean, for crying out loud, Nick, I'd rather pay my third next year and my third two years from now to just make that deal well, work. Well, for Atlanta. Give up, give up, give up 122 this year because we know the drop off is there. Give up 122 and future third you know what i mean exactly then give up a second but point right. being if there's a trade-up i don't think you need to go to five love marvin harrison i do think there's a little bit of branding going on when it comes to mhj whereas if you could just get that wide receiver three i am here for a trade-up just don't tell me you need to trade up and then you take joe alt all three are good all, i mean i and honestly i'm i'm not in the crazy world of i think all three you, people could pick who their favorites are I mean, I that that's why I did a poll. I was like, okay, who's your best receivers? I just put I put one through three. I put these three. I didn't even put what order because I'm like, you could say whatever order you wanted. I mm-hmm. get it. Yeah, perfect, man. All right, man. What a good. I love these conversations, man. Yeah. What you got coming up? Uh, honestly, man, I've been running it pretty thin. I'm gonna probably chill out. We have a we have a wedding shower this weekend. Ooh, um, yeah. today. Yeah, today I uh, earlier I recorded at Football Guys. We did a breakdown of Jaden Daniels, uh, uh, the strengths and weaknesses. So that'll be a, a video coming out if you guys want to tune into that one. I did that one with uh, Alfredo. He's a, a really good guy at Football Guys. So we'll be doing some some kind of draft videos like that. But yeah, I'm just kind of crunching down some of the some of the numbers and uh, like like even like this checking the top thirty visits. You know, and I'm excited. You know what we should think about is draft day if we want to do anything oh yeah we'll be thinking so, about it so, so maybe maybe guys, guys if, if you would watch maybe you have a comment of that because i mean if, if no one's going to watch i don't know if we would do it but if you know all right what we'll do so just let us know what you guys want let that's us know an idea. Yeah. keep an eye on dbb for more nine at nine and different breakdowns to come until next time bears fans Thanks so much for listening. Leave us a review if you enjoyed it. Give us a comment. We do read those. And until next time, Bears fans, bear down. Thanks so much for bearing with us.